Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to Getting Stoked. Um, on this week, we have Alejandro, I think his last name is pronounced Fontes. We're going to say Alejandro is on the show from Santan Brewing Company. He is their, their, he's their, their talk guy. He's the one who goes out and tells everybody how wonderful their beer is. Now, um, I'm having him on the show because I have probably consumed more Santan beer on this show than any other kind of beer. Um, I love them a lot. I like their ethic. I like the way that they do things. Um, I've always saw them as a very, very smart company. And I wanted to be able to learn a little bit about beer, man. I, I drink a lot of beer and I don't get to, I don't really know anything about it. I'm sure there's a how it's made about beer, but I've not seen it. So this was kind of my chance to sit down with somebody inside the beer industry, you know, as inside a beer industry as you can be and really talk about um, kind of how that works, man. Kind of get into the mind of... Uh, of people who are making the brewski. So there you have it. Alejandro from Santan Brewing Company on the show. Please give it up. I like Sweet Lou. Is Sweet one of the, Lou. Is one of the greatest movie characters ever. <laughs> well, um, oh, hey, we're rolling, by the way. Hi. Hi. <laughs> thanks for coming on, man. I appreciate of it. Of course. Thanks for having me, man. Um, we were just talking about Grind, which was the which was an episode that, I guess, when this airs, it was a few episodes ago. But, um, yeah, dude, I grew up watching that movie. And when watching it as an adult made me realize that it's he's literally like – Sweet Lou is a great value Matthew McConaughey and Days and Confused. Yeah. <laughs> he could have been our generation, uh, Matthew McConaughey, but that, that performance was just such another level Yeah, uh, that even Sweet Lou couldn't touch it as, <laughs> as badass as he was. And uh, Obviously, he got in a little more trouble than Matthew McConaughey ever did in Days and Confused. Yeah, I, th that movie was so fucking... Yeah, it was ridiculous. There, were, I mean, it... I laughed a lot more than I had expected to, and a lot of those things were laughs that were supposed to be there. There was a lot of stuff we were laughing because, like, this is so stupid. But it felt like Brink in a way. Like yeah, the old, the old yeah, we were talking about Brink, too. We were like, dude, we need to make this a thing now. We need to, like, get together once a month and watch, like, an extreme sports movie from when we were kids. <laughs> I remember trying to make an obscure reference to Grind one time, and I just had somebody stare at me, and I went to explain it, and I was just like, mm, I bet there's, like, me yeah. and three other people have seen this movie <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was it, it's crazy how many people actually did like i was really into skateboarding though when i was a kid oh, yeah. so that movie was like my jam man yeah. freedom board shop was the place to be man yeah see i wasn't from around here when ah. i grew up so i didn't know about, i don't know about any of that stuff when i moved out here i found cowtown yeah and the cowtown was super cool and their uh their street team is awesome i remember wanting to be a a, a skater so bad but i was uh, such a pansy i was just like man these, these kickflips hitting my shins don't feel good I, <laughs> i'm just gonna hop on a bike where you know i can you, be a little freer you never had the opportunity to give jimmy wilson your sponsor me tape. no i know man <laughs> i still yell like uh what do they yell uh product toss or whatever and the the crowd goes nuts i still oh, yell yeah, that every yeah, once yeah. in a while at promos. <laughs> speaking of promos what's this beer that you brought over to us today um what so got? i brought you uh our latest and greatest and probably the hottest beer for us right now we call it juicy jack okay um hazy ipas are all the thing right now mm -hmm. um but this one actually began as a homebrew recipe uh from steven who's our pub brewery he leads all the uh all the small batch stuff there that we need at the pub Very and cool. uh perfected it on his homebrew i had the dude's insane, man. He, he homebrews <laughs> like at least once a weekend, if not every other weekend. And uh, this is a, a product of his hard work, and he brought it to the boss. And, uh, you know, he convinced Anthony to let him try it on the uh, the 15 barrel system. And ever since the first batch, man, he's killed it. And uh, this beer uh, was just on, on Pace Magazine on their That's website crazy. for uh, IPA blind taste testing. Oh. And it's just got this really juicy quality as any uh, hazy IPA should with. Uh, cashmere hops and uh just very juicy to the taste oh wow that's delicious oh yeah you don't need the coaster I don't, this is just here for decoration um <laughs> this table's not that nice so what exactly do you do uh for santan brewing company um i've done a little bit of everything i've been there for six just over six years now uh this summer and uh nowadays i'm doing sales analytics and a little bit of some marketing uh and also head up our brewery events so uh, festival planning and stuff like that. I get behind, uh, you know, being out talking to people is so fun. Yeah. Uh, just sharing the Santan story with people that have seen you a million times and people that are just seeing you for the first time. And 
Uh, it's so cool to be out there. So I'm, I get this lucky balance of staring at spreadsheets all day, but also gearing us up for some of the fun festivals. That's awesome. So what is the Santan story? I don't know it. Um, so Santan is, uh, I can, I'll, we'll Tarantino this for a little bit uh, today. <laughs> We are uh, Arizona's largest craft brewery, uh, but you know, if you want to go by the definition of craft, and um, we are the second what largest Sorry, brewery. What is, what is the definition it, of craft? Today, like? it's you know independent breweries. Okay. It's the, the the definition is so muddled these yeah. days. Um, what we knew, do know is that uh, we're the second largest Arizona brewery in general. Um, First being Four Peaks. Yeah, of course. We got some good friends over there, and uh, a couple of their brewers are uh, really talented. Second place tries harder. Yeah, <laughs> we uh, to, to quote Anchorman, and that's kind of how I feel about it too. Um, those guys still crank out quality brews. They've got some of the best brewers in the state. Um, which luckily, right now in the whole state of Arizona, we've got like just a good tier of high quality brewers. Um, from Flagstaff down to Tucson, out to Yuma, um, the state's really well represented right now. There's some uh, national medals coming in for some of our states. Um, but I, I digress. Yeah, you're good. Um, Santan itself started in 2007. Uh, mm-hmm. Anthony Konecki, our founder and brewmaster, uh, had been homebrewing, uh, as a hobby as the old story goes for a lot of, uh, breweries our age, uh, where he just wanted to try it more professionally. He, uh, it, it's kind of one of those great business stories of where he had to face, uh, going to all these banks that were just saying no to him, trying to get loans to get something open. And uh, he was able to get a friend of his, Aaron Sanchez, um, who we call him our silent owner. Um, he was able to get him to help out, and they uh, found the perfect location at downtown Chandler, which I don't know how long you've been around the Valley. I've been around the Valley since 2008, but I've only been 21 since 2000 and So something. a relatively young yeah, drinker. Relatively, um, yeah. So back in the day, I've, I've been born and raised here where uh, Chandler for a while, especially downtown, wasn't the nicest area. It wasn't somewhere that a lot of people really wanted to go to. You had to go there for um, certain reasons. What, for us, it was usually driving to get to Tucson before the 202 was built. Mm-hmm. Well, Anthony uh, brings the brewery in and automatically uh, it, it's a huge hit. They got some early uh, publicity that they weren't exactly expecting. And I've heard Anthony tell stories of uh, barely having one beer on tap well after people started showing up. and But everybody loved it because it was something new. And uh, obviously, Anthony's brewing technique uh, speaks for itself because it's survived for now 11 years. Um, and he's got, obviously, a ton of guys underneath him. Um, I've Most of what I've known or come to know about beer came from, like, the apprentice brewers that I would be working with. Um, kind of next to when I was working in the pub. Um, so just grinded through uh, kind of an explosion of craft beer there for a little while. Uh, going into cans really helped establish who we are. I mean, you can see the, the big cans in yeah. front of you. Um, but that's all we do is cans, and that, that kind of gave us our niche and our, uh, our area of uh, expertise of craft in a can. Um, we followed some of the greats like Oscar Blues and uh, some of the, the guys that really led craft in a can and said, look, we can put quality beer in a vessel that used to have kind of a stigma to it, uh, which is a tougher way to approach it. But, you know, taking the, taking the long way around sometimes is more beneficial. What about the cans changes? So, okay. So I'm going to ask you a lot of questions that are technical to, to someone to, yeah, for someone like you is all like really basic knowledge, but I've only, so it's crazy. I turned 21 and I don't know, 20 something. And then, um, I've only, but I've only been, uh, since it was like 2013, 2014 ish. Um, and when that happened, I wasn't really drinking at the time at all. I had no experience in really drinking beer for some, I never like got fucked up as a teenager or anything like that. Um, I was doing way dumber things like smoking cigarettes and like like so, stuff that I wasn't even getting that much of a, a enjoyment. But you from. felt like such a rebel. Oh yeah, I felt so cool. So, um, but so alcohol was never really a thing for me. And then, I, uh, then like, my 21st birthday, I had, like, the neck of a Coors Light or Corona or something. And I was like, nah, this isn't for me. And then I started, didn't start drinking really until uh, a couple of years ago. And I, I fell into the craft stuff really, really hard. And I think that just speaks to me as, like, a creative. What was the first one you fell in love with? Um, the first beer that I fell in love with that was a craft beer was probably, um, oh, man. I want to say probably... 
Hop Knot. Four nice. Peaks Hop Knot yeah. was one of the first ones where I was like, oh, this is awesome. And then and then I developed the taste for hoppy beer really quickly. You dove right into the IPA, huh? Yeah, I, I dove like... right into the IPA. Because, well, I was I, what happened was I brought over PBR to my girlfriend's parents' house. And they're, like, super cool, like, kind of young, somewhat, like, hip cool people. And I, I brought – so I brought over – uh, like a big fucking 12 of of, of a PBR and they just gave me shit for it and railed me for it all night long and her dad is like real into like IPAs and he's always trying new stuff and he's he's he has a really good taste for it so he just turned me on to some like really good stuff every time I would come over there he'd show me something new so then I just kind of developed a taste through there and then um, so yeah I fell right into the IPAs immediately and I got really into um, just really hoppy shit. Anything with hop in the name, I'm usually down with. Um, so I did that. I got really into that for a little while. I tried some other things. I tried like Kolsch's. Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah. Eh, not really. Not really my, my dig. Lighter, easier styles, usually. Yeah, usually. I, but I had like a German Kolsch <coughs> once that was just – it was the Scottsdale Blonde. Yeah. It was uh, – Great beer. Y- yeah. Nah. Technically, <laughs> technically speaking, it's a great beer. But uh, everybody has different taste buds. Yeah, like, I know. Um, like I'll, I'll slam a, a, any kind of Kolsch or an, uh, lighter lager beers and lighter ales. Um, you know, poolside or I'm, I'm a very situational drinker. Okay. Um, you, you know, if I'm drinking something heavier, it's usually cause I'm eating something more full. Um, you know, if I'm enjoying some kind of outdoor activities, I lighten it up to Definitely. like our Mr. Pineapple or Scasso Blonde's a great one. Um, and then you, <clears throat> there's different ones of like, uh, maybe I just feel kind of outgoing and want to try something different. So I'm trying sour beers and different saisons. I've had some really good sour beers. Yeah, and they're but they're tough like IPAs are hard enough to get into for the normal craft beer mm-hmm. or for a, a someone that doesn't enjoy craft the, beer the that often. Citizen drinker. Yeah, and then <laughs> sours are just like even harder for them to get into and it's just like um if you're not somebody that's into more acidic beers and have that big pucker punch, uh, it's not going to be your thing, but I was a kid that would shove three blue warheads in my mouth because <laughs> yeah me too <laughs> you know, I, and i ate lemons off the tree so going into sour beers was kind of a natural uh, thing for me but yeah. i know that's not everybody whether it's uh you know they don't want something sour they don't want something hoppy um you know even sweet and malty is uh not somebody's taste and it's just cool because um there's so many different types of beers that there has to be one for somebody um it, there's so many different types by so many different types of brewers and just spending uh even like a 30 minute window and a Bevmo or total wine, you should be able to find something you like. Definitely. You might have to try quite yeah. a few of them, but um, that's, what's great about craft beers. There's always something for someone. Yeah. I'm looking through, I have that awesome app, the untapped uh-huh. app. And um, I am, so I'm looking through it right now and I'm trying to find like my highest rated stuff on here because because uh, now I have I can talk to somebody who has a frame of reference about uh, all of this. Stuff. Looking for those five bottle cap beers. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, one that I liked I, a lot was F Y I T M. Yeah, I've yeah I don't it's the the shop beer company. Oh, yeah. I gave that one a five. I really liked that. I don't really remember where I was when I had that. Those guys yeah. are killing it right now. Um, I love going down to the shop and having beers down there and uh, just hanging out with those guys and yeah. Um, we get to see them at festivals once in a while. I, I live in Gilbert now, so it's uh, there you go. I don't get to get to Tempe that often. Yeah. Um, but luckily, I got some cool craft bars that are really close to my house. Um, so every once in a while, I get to, to enjoy a pint from uh, the, the shop. And um, the collaborations that they've been a part of are pretty fantastic. And uh, that's what's really cool is we've all kind of uh, grown into this scene where now all these breweries are starting to collaborate a little more. Um you know, the laws really loosened up a couple of years ago that allow that to happen. Well, yeah, go into that a little bit, because I've <clears> heard <throat> some things here and there about, like, the, having to change certain things and whatnot. Luckily for us, we haven't had to change a lot. Um, our, our beer laws are pretty damn fair here in the state. Um, as with anything that's regulated, there's there's some headaches and some things that are more of a pain in the ass and, than a benefit. And by that, you mean, like, the actual brewing process, yeah. right? Yeah, uh, whether it's brewing, uh, selling is really the, the most restricted part, because um, obviously... Uh, first of all, it, it is alcohol. Um, you know, it's got to be enjoyed by the right people, and it's got to be got to be promoted to the right people. Um, so, with that comes, you know, uh, a great power comes great responsibility. Yeah. Um, so, we're all kind of like our own Spider Man, um, <laughs> where uh, the laws are more directed to make us behave, um, to make sure that uh, trade practices are fair. Um, you know, if somebody's not handing out truckloads of beer for free while the rest of us are actually trying to make a, a yeah, dollar. Totally. Um, 
So we've had a great run of fair legal practices. Um, there was one a couple years ago that uh, they changed the definition of what a growler was for the most part, uh, basically allowing us to use aluminum uh, or stainless steel. Mm. Uh, so we could change the vessel. I think it, we could also use um, like porcelain or something like that because mm. there's some really fancy growlers out there. Yeah, I was about to say, um, I've never seen a porcelain But also growler. around that same time, uh, we were able to – lighten up the rules on what we do with collaboration beers and it came down to like definitions of you know who's in who's in possession of it who can actually distribute it and just tweaking those things so the legislators here in the state uh have been phenomenal at working with us because it is beer um and the good thing with craft beer is that it's it's mostly promoted and enjoyed responsibly um you know i haven't seen an episode of cops or some guy like stumbles out of his you know corvette and all of a sudden there's just a bunch of craft beer cans <laughs> out. you know it, we haven't seen stuff like that so our, our drinker seems to be a little more responsible yeah um but i also think that's kind of human nature i think people are starting to wisen up like look this this shiny toy could get taken away from us if we keep slamming a bunch of beers and driving drunk and um, doing all the dumb stuff that we hope that people don't use this as an avenue for. Um, so we make sure that we behave ourselves on a on a brewing level, on a sales level, and uh, in turn we hope that kind of rubs off on the people who enjoy our beers to uh, also behave themselves. I wonder what it is about craft beer that attracts the different crowd than like you know I, I've, I've had plenty of I've gone out plenty of nights with friends who are just like get you know come back to my apartment after the bar with a 50 case of you know or a 50 rack of fucking Coors Lights and then just get completely belligerent like but I don't see that with craft beers and you're right I, but I've never thought about that before like but I wonder what it is that changes that. we don't see it and it, it's also it does happen of course um, it happens but there's there's always idiots mean. in every bunch and, yeah um but if we keep promoting our message uh, whenever we talk to people. I remember we were doing training for our new restaurant up in Phoenix. And, and you know, one of the things that I hammered home to everybody that came there was guys. In, um, I know you might have gotten away with it at this point. You know, I know there's some bad examples. And I know uh, there's a lot of people that are like, oh, you know, I'm under 0.08. I know I can. And I just reminded them, don't, don't even risk it. We all, yeah. we all represent a brewery now, um, which means now the spotlight shines a little more if we get caught screwing around like that. How does a... How does a craft beer get into somewhere like Fry's? Hard work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was wondering, because I, I see them there all the time, and, the, and so often there's, like, because the, I the, my favorite thing is just to go into Fry's whenever I go to the grocery and get the get the six, like, try, like, mix and match, six yeah. pack. And that's how I always find out about really cool craft beers. And I always wonder, like, because I know what it's like to come from, a like, a DIY background. I mean, that's all. I mean, I still am in that background right now. <laughs> and so I, I know that it, it – Getting stuff out like that is different for every creative um, product, and I always wonder, like, how is it, what do you guys, what hoops do you have to jump through to get them into popular stores like that? I mean, there's a ton. Uh, my direct boss, uh, Matt, he's just fantastic at what he does, and um, he's able to uh, work with the decision makers that get to call the shots. But a lot of their shots are basically determined on, you know, how good is your product, first of all. Um, they're not going to bring in anything they don't think is that quality or of high quality because they don't want to, in turn, send it to their customers who don't like it. You know, they don't want return product. Um, and for us, it's, you know, how great is the beer um, and how well does it do outside of that, that store? Um, so is there proof behind it? And then sometimes um, there's actually been quite a few uh, decisions that have literally come down to, they tried it and they loved it themselves and they knew uh, that their customer would be attracted to it. And um, so it comes from a lot of hard work from not not just my boss, but a lot of people involved. And it goes all the way down to the guy that first brewed the batch to make sure that it was uh, a damn good beer and something that should be sold in a, in a yeah. store like in Fry's. So I've uh, <laughs> I've seen it in movies a few times, but is what is the home brewing process like? Um, I, I know from... Not experienced because yeah. uh, I'm not a homebrewer myself. Yeah. I, uh, I've seen shit blow up and shameless and stuff, but aside from that, no, I don't no. Know what it's uh, like. As long as you don't have William H Macy in your garage uh, trying something like that, um, no. Uh, uh, brewing beer is an industrial practice, so in any situation, if you're being unsafe, you can do some dumb, some yeah. damage. But uh, for the most part, on a home scale, um, you know, it's like a really pieced together brew kit, usually like cut out kegs. Uh, with holes to cut out of the top of them to turn them into boiling pots. And um, it's a lot of piecemeal 
uh, equipment that they get from their local brew shop, um, that they get through friends who brew, and maybe even uh, sometimes the local breweries will help uh, if you need equipment, like if you know your brewer really well. Um, so it, it's almost like a mad science lab of just all this different equipment pieced together, um, usually designed out of a book that they were reading. Um, and so it's a, that's why it's a labor of love because yeah. they have to build all that. And it's all for like maybe five gallons, maybe. Yeah. And uh, which sounds like a lot when you think, oh, drinking five gallons yeah. of beer. Like, <laughs> that's intense, man. Uh, but when it comes down to it and you're, you're producing something and you're putting hours of work into it, it's, it's literally like a torpedo of beer. Yeah. Um, so I, I, that's why. Um, I love our brewers. I love all brewers I've met because I've seen just the hard work that they've put into in their own garages. And then I'm very fortunate to get to see some of these guys and girls out um, brewing on big systems that they grew into. That's amazing. Yeah, I, I've never seen, I'm sure it's out there, but I haven't seen like a how it's made on on beer. Like I'm have, sure there's I a few out no there. I have no idea there. how beer is brewed at all. Like I know that there's stuff in it this barley has a thing in it i don't know like the, how any of that works it's it's basically four main ingredients man it's barley um hops water and yeast and what is hops exactly hops is uh it's a flower um uh-huh. mostly grows around the 38th parallel on both sides of the world um so primarily uh the pacific northwest uh down in australia and new zealand and then there's some places in between like i know uh i think there's a hop growing project up in flagstaff or you know maybe somebody's sense backyard so somewhere where it's a little nicer um and the heat isn't going to rot your vines out and you, um, you just mix them in a barrel of so stuff. it'll uh the big process it's a very it's a long process the the more professional the system goes um but it essentially comes down to you want to extract the sugars out of malts and barley and stuff like that out of grains um and in doing so you're basically creating a big batch of sugar water uh, and then you cook it up to temperature. You add your hops. I, I'm really simplifying it. Yeah, there's no, probably, please do. There's going to be a few brewer <laughs> friends that are cringing like, no, dude, it's fine. It's fine. You're, you're way oversimplifying. <laughs> but it, 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 so you, you uh, cook it up in your kettle. Um, and then to get it up to well, certain gravities and you want, you want a certain sugar concentration in the water that will help you determine your alcohol content and some of the flavors and stuff like that. And then you pump it into a tank and basically let a bunch of yeast in there, which is uh, live bacteria or organism. Which is just what grows naturally in there. Yeah, right? and, and there's like there's harvested yeast. There's labs that you can order yeast from. There's even some beers that um, I've seen where you can just leave tanks out like in the forest and just let some of the natural bacteria in the air collect into the beer. And um, There's so many different ways that you can harvest what yeah. can turn your uh, wort, sugar, mm-hmm. uh, into alcohol and CO2. So... It, it comes down, like, really simplify. It comes down to a basic equation of um, when yeast feeds off of sugar uh, and gives you your, your CO2 and uh, alcohol content. That's crazy. And, and that, I didn't realize how much, like, crazy <laughs> amounts of science goes into – I mean, I should have thought about it. I mean, it I, is. It's, that's all it is is science. It's yeah. chemistry and biology working together um, to turn sugar water into a fantastic drink to share with your friends. <laughs> so what was your in, how, what was your introduction to – I guess this company or just the, the, the uh, hobby or passion in general. So my story at Santan began, um, way back when I was working for Barrow's pizza. Oh shit. <laughs> um, it, it's kind of a rite of passage in Gilbert that if you grew up in Gilbert, you probably worked for Barrow's at some point, at least I from, could attest from yeah. our generation on. Mm-hmm. Um, that's where I went to high school. I went to high school in Gilbert. Oh yeah. So yeah. Uh, where'd you go? Gilbert. We went to Gilbert High. Yeah, I was a tiger. Yeah, uh, nice. I went uh, to proud home of uh, Lydia and uh, a few other uh, bands that came Lydia, out. Lydia, yeah, of course. They just put out a new album. Um, yeah, uh, I just. Sorry about that. Yeah, you're good. I moved out here uh, freshman year of high school, and I went to Williamsfield, right, like right okay. when it opened. I, I don't like, think, think think Williamsfield existed when I graduated. From I it, right? yeah, <laughs> I I went there in 2009, and we were like the second graduating class that they yeah. had there. Yeah, definitely wasn't there. When yeah, I was there. <laughs> there's still a few schools that I drive by. I'm like, what? Yeah. Where did this come from? Right? Yeah, so that, I know Gilbert um, super well, and we used to walk to Santan Mall back when Hot Dog on a Stick was still there. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it's um, – Sorry, you're – I My days at Santan started because I was at uh, Barrow's. Um, I was delivering pizzas and working in the kitchen at a certain point and uh, decided I want to go back to serving tables. Um, you know, obviously serving jobs are a good way to stack up some money in mm-hmm. your, your mid-20s and stuff like that. 
and without um, wear and tear in your car and gas and shit like that. Yeah, um, which ended up coming later, anyways. <laughs> um, and so I ended up. Uh, we had we always had Epicenter and Devils on at uh, Barrows. So this was kind of my first step into craft beer in general um, was when I started trying to drink Devil's Ale and didn't like it at first. I love Devil. Is that your it's, is that the big best? Is that the best seller over there? Moon Juice is now. Moon Devils is now. used to be. Um, but Moon Juice just absolutely, uh, pardon the pun, just like skyrocketed. No, you're good. <laughs> and uh, it's so when I was trying to drink Devils and didn't really like it. And luckily we had Epicenter on. Um, and I was able to try Epicenter, which is just a maltier, easier drinking uh, amber style beer as opposed to the hoppy as hell Devil's Ale. Mm-hmm. Uh, and even Devil's um, is, is hoppier than most pale ales should be. And so it's an American uh, hoppy pale ale. And so luckily I found Epicenter and I, I started like kind of like. I oh. haven't had that. Is that still like a. At the pub and we do it in draft at different bars and restaurants. But Got it. I've never seen it like in a can out in Yeah, before. it's been years since we had the, uh, the can. Um, but. Um, decided to do a little research and dig into who Santan was. And uh, I was like, oh, cool. This is a brewery in downtown Chandler. Didn't even know there's anything down there right now. <laughs> um, and ended up applying for a serving position. Um, our part owner and GM, uh, Jamie, said, hey, I uh, really want you to work here, but all we have is uh, mm-hmm. busing positions available. I think, uh, you know, coming in, uh, I started in June uh, way back when. Um, obviously, restaurant businesses slow down. They're not in hiring as, uh, as many new people on so. I took the job, worked two for a while, grinded my way through Santan, and uh, just took every job that they asked me to do. They're like, hey, we need you to help in the kitchen. Um, I had cooking experience from Barrows. Um, and then I just kind of took every little thing that they would throw at me and eventually uh, came to join the sales team um, probably three, four years ago now. So you didn't do anything in the like the uh, the brewery, like the actual, like you didn't brew any beers or anything? No, like those guys... Uh, Is that like a really crazy skill set? Those guys are way there? tougher than I am. <laughs> and, um, and I've... Uh, the, some of the busters that uh, I got to know when I was busing ended up going into the warehouse and production and stuff like that. And That's cool. I just remember them just like always after work would be hanging out like Hondro, come on you gotta you gotta come brew with us and i would just look at him and I'm like no you guys, <laughs> you guys have way bigger balls than i do um i want to focus on uh really establishing our our image and uh our branding and um, that's why i went towards the sales team that's cool it's crazy i never you have to think about it like i, I guess when you're talking about having balls it comes down to like they could ruin an entire batch if they just fuck up one thing right yeah th- i mean there's high pressure but i just the grind every day yeah. i mean you come in if you ever get a chance to come by chandler again um during a brew uh there's a times like when uh so when you're done soaking the grain you got to pull it all out of the mash tun and then once you're done, everything has to be sterilized. And beer, every you got to sterilize everything. You have to have clean procedures, or you're going to get shitty beer. Um, and so, uh, you could like be walking by, and you'll see one of our brewers literally on his hands and knees inside the mash tun after it just had 100 and some degree water. Holy and shit. so it's just radiating inside, and it's humid, and they're just in there scrubbing our way. <laughs> and um, you know, just cleaning procedures alone can can wear you out. And obviously, throwing around kegs and filling stuff. That's that's why I love uh, hanging out with those guys. And having a pint with them whenever I can is because, um, you know, they're the backbone of the company and they, they really push, uh, they really give us a chance to go sell anything. We don't have anything to sell if I don't have, totally if we don't have brewers uh, busting their asses for us. That's cool. It's cool that you got to, uh, you got to go the route of being the people guy and yeah, like, kind of how, like that's, that's really interesting that you fell into like such a niche role. It is. And then there's times where I hang out with the brewers and, um, get to try their beer and i'm just like sometimes you get that that small little envy you're like man i wish i was that good and made that and so it, it's cool to um i you know kind of internally fanboy uh when i get to hang out with certain brewers that are here in the valley and uh literally drink their beers with them and um that's that's the coolest part because i i know the sweat and tears that went mm-hmm. into making that pint that i get to have that's cool it, it so as far as like, what is it like having a competitor like Four Peaks, who you guys also like respect a lot in a very what what seems to be a very kind of cool way? It's I mean the, their stories go way back before I do. So yeah. first of all, just me even coming into the scene six years ago, it's, <laughs> it turns into a mind your elders and respect your yeah. elders kind of thing. Um, you know, Anthony came from Four Peaks years ago. Um, and branched off and, set, and started uh, Santan instead. That's cool. I didn't know that. Yeah, and that's um, that's where he got to fine tune some of his professional brewing technique. And so, it, you know, it, it becomes a you know, 
first of all, nobody wants to be negative when you have a beer. Of course, yeah. Um, you know, when you're having beers with your buddy, there's nothing worse than, you know, somebody that just sits there and goes, you know what, man, that guy sucks, that guy sucks. And you're just like, you don't want to be surrounded by it when you're having a beer, let alone when you're making it, selling yeah. it, stuff like that. So it just really becomes a, you know, do we really want to sit there and baker over, um, you know, get their beer, get their our beer. Um, when we're around each other, we gr- we'll grab a beer together all the time. Um, or at least if we have the time to mm-hmm. sit down and enjoy a beer together. So, yeah, there's there's always a sales side. There's always a competitive side to it. It's business mm-hmm. um, as long as it's nothing dirty or cheap yeah. or anything like that. And it's always just uh, be respectful of each other um, in ways that uh, are very controllable. Uh, and just don't ever be that guy in the industry. Don't 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 badmouth people just because, you know, they have a job to do and you have the job to do. And sometimes they, they, it, those jobs collide. Yeah. And they've been around, how long have they been around? 21 years now. Damn. I think. Yeah. And Santan's been around since 2007. Seven. So 11. Uh, and it's been a fun ride for the six of it. And I'm sure Anthony's, <laughs> Anthony's been doing it way longer than 11 years, man. He's, he's been, I'm sure he's had dreams of Santan long before that. Yeah. I think I, I, I perused through the website real quick and I, and I think I read that he started doing it as a hobby in like 95, yeah, something like that. Like that's, that's crazy. It's crazy how long shit like that takes to become like a legit self-sustaining profitable business. I mean, and you think about it on music terms of like, yeah. Um, you know, I, I can probably, if I pick up that guitar right now, I can probably play you four chords or something that I've mm-hmm. learned once upon a time. And, yeah. Uh, I can probably play you the first five notes of six different songs, but yeah. that's like as far as I've gone. And, <laughs> um, so I'm definitely not going to go and ask Marquis if I can open up for the next Rise Against show or something. Definitely. Um, you know, it would be, it, that would be the equivalent of, hey, I've made a couple batches of beer. I've been doing this for like six months. I should open up a whole building. And yeah. Like, so it does take time and it, as with any craft which is what beer is it, it's a craft um you have to take the time and perfect it that's what's so cool about the the, th- the interesting thing about creativity is that it it all speaks the same language like whether you're a musician or a writer or a podcaster or a filmmaker or a craft beer um what craft beersman what is the brewer, brewer, yeah. brewer. Brewers. um no matter what you're doing as far as long as it's creative we all can kind of agree and align on very, very similar things. Like yeah. the, the process is – the only thing that's different about the process is, is are the minute details of what the product or what the end goal is yeah. that you're doing. But as far as getting there and pushing and doing everything yourself and trying to get out there, it's pretty much like it's all the same shit. It's just through different filters. Yeah, and it's um, that's what's cool about beer, just like any other art form, is everybody's got a slightly different technique as opposed to, or, you know, to each other, um, where one brewer might like to add hops at a certain time on a certain style of beer, like a pale ale. They might want to add, you know, more hops up front in the boil as opposed to on the back end on the in, after fermentation, uh, or that some brewers just want to dry hop the hell out of their beers. Um, what does that mean? Uh, dry hopping is basically uh, when it's in the fermentation tank and it's getting ready to finish. It, once it's in fermentation is when beer is uh, or the yeast is feeding and uh, turning the, the wort into beer. Um, so as you get towards the end of it, you basically uh, dump a bunch of dry hops into it uh, so that the batch, uh, basically what it'll do is give you the flavors like right away. Um, there's really different types of hop techniques that even we've been trying some new ones on. Maybe we don't add them in the boil, which will give off different flavors. So when you taste a, a hoppy beer, you should you should be tasting hops up front, and then there's hops that you taste after you've tasted the beer. Yeah, definitely. Um, so the aroma that sticks around. Uh, and that's what's cool about it is you can uh, tink- tinker with that, and you can give a certain flavor from a certain hop right up front and have a different hop finish on the back end mm. and give it a totally different vibe. Uh, so it's – it that's where it becomes cooking. So yeah. now we've got <laughs> chemistry, biology, and cooking uh, all mixed in, which is uh, which is why beer's so awesome. Man. Yeah, that's so crazy. It's so um, malleable, and its limits are just basically what a brewer can develop in their head. So I don't know what you can and can't give away, but what is the – now, what is your guys' – like, I know you have a hop, like a hop beer there, like a specific. Don't you have a beer with hop in the name over there? Hop Shock. Hop Shock, We've yes. got Kilo Hop as well, which is out that. right now, which is um, – it is literally two and a half pounds of hops per barrel. So a barrel of beer is roughly two kegs. Okay. Um, and so we 
took this beer that we kick up with a bunch of Arizona honey to get the alcohol content up and kind of finish a little drier. Um, and then we just hop the living crap out of it um, with uh, exclusively citra hops, which is a type of hop. Yeah. Um, and that one has been around for quite a few years and has been pretty popular. We release awesome. it like every May now. That's awesome. Yeah, I love I love Hop Shock. Like that's the one that I I get from you guys. And um, I always just like is that like I guess when it comes to, when it comes to hops, like do, are you just again these are all like really stupid questions because I don't know anything about no any I love of this and stuff. I, I love talking beer to um, any, anybody <laughs> at any level. Which is awesome. <laughs> um, but like is, is that an example of like dry hops or it, it does get dry hopped yeah it does get dry hopped. um and, and most beers get some kind of dry hopping it just yeah. depends on if brewers want that really um forward hop bite on it um you know some beers might just get a little dry hopped at the end and that's just to give it just a small little hint of something does does all beer have hops in it oh yeah so so what what's the difference then between a craft beer which usually has from my experience has more hops than your general like light light beer that you're gonna get from the store. Like, but like Coors Light, for instance, I I'm not a seasoned beer tester or drinker, but I can't pull the hops out of that. They're if I there, to. and and it's obviously brewed to be very subtle because mm -hmm. um, the the hop forward beers don't uh, really get every drinker. Yeah, and there's some drinkers that literally just want to taste that kind of beer. Mm -hmm. Um, and all it is is technique. It's um I, and the brewers at Coors maybe, you know, have much bigger machines. And I push. say Coors, but like... Coors but those no guys, you know, they, yeah. they they might push a little more buttons and have things a little more automated, but they do have to be... They do have to carefully craft what they're trying to make. And um, so the ingredients are roughly, uh, you know, still the same. You still have to use the four major ingredients. Um, they uh, use extra filtration. There's some. There's so many different ways that you can add hops in enough to be the preserver that it's supposed to be. It actually keeps your beer lasting is what um, hops were originally introduced for. Really? Yeah, it was a, it's a preservation technique because they can stretch out the life of the beer and protect it from getting spoiled. Um, huh. So it was, it's always been a necessity. Um, that's why IPAs, India Pale Ales, they, when the boats had to make the rounds to get beers down to India from England, um, they would put hops in the beer to make sure that it didn't spoil on the ships. And that's why they're so hoppy. Yeah. That, that's so cool. <laughs> All and, these pieces are coming together. <laughs> and so lighter beers like that are just brewed to be lighter beers. They're lagers. They're still beer. Yeah. Um, it's still the basic chemistry and biology of it. So it, it, to say it's not beer no, uh, I get would it. just be lying in the uh, to yourself. Really. Yeah. <laughs> um, and obviously everybody's going to have different styles. There's, there's certain people I, I I'm – I lived out east for five years, and Natty Light was, like, the only thing that everybody drank. And, yeah. um, and I still can't get some of my friends from out east to stop drinking Natty Light <laughs> and support their breweries. And uh, it's, you know, you're just not going to please all the people all the time with everything you're trying to do. So um, when it comes down to that beer, it's just that style that they, they want to sell. What is it about Arizona that attracts so much – craft beer and because so, there's a lot of breweries here but like i mean i'm from the midwest like i in ohio there's not a whole lot going on maybe in like columbus and cincinnati but yeah there's some good ones coming up but like f when i was growing up for sure i were like i mean i know i wasn't going to bars or anything but i didn't really start hearing that stuff until i moved out here but w is that a lot to do with just craft beer blowing up like it's the it time did, yeah the time it's the time of, of the age right now and um it's even getting to you know they, there's warning signs that it, you know craft beer has reached its ceiling and stuff like whatever they want to scare people mm. with and, yeah um it's still being enjoyed by more people um as people turn 21 and come into their drinking age of um you know, you go through the bar scene when you're 21, or at least around here, you drink your cheap beers because you got to keep your tabs low and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And um, eventually you start getting a more refined taste. It happens to everybody at a yeah. certain point, usually. Um, here in Arizona specifically, I think it's just the collection of beer um, that's been coming out. I mean, you can we, we've talked about Four Peaks, that so you can kind of attribute a lot of the growth here to them because... Um, there we're the local example of look we can do this and uh, I, I'm I've no brewers that have personally uh, enjoyed those beers so much that it led them to try brewing 
Um, and so it's just like a domino that fell and eventually um, it's scattered through the state. And as people have moved here from Colorado and California and um, even people that have had their roots here like I have, um, you know, they've seen that, hey, what I, I want to contribute to this and I want to help make it better. And so when a bunch of people want to get together and make something better, usually it, um, it, it spreads even further and it, it becomes this growth factor of good quality beer. And that's kind of we're in like a renaissance of Arizona beer right now. I mean, Tucson's got uh, yeah, Tucson's old favorites good. popping up downtown now. Their downtown's having its own revitalization, but um, like Iron John's just opened up down there, and uh, I think 1055's next, if I remember right, and Thunder Canyon's still down there. And, um, so it's a lot of good beer has been brewed here, which has led people to want to keep that growing here. So you were talking about <clears throat> a ceiling earlier. Can you expand on that a little bit? What's um, the theory? What are people saying? That you can only convert so many people. Um, I mean, there's nine hundred different ways to look at it and um at a certain point as with any market that you're going to see substantial growth you're going to see it see it see it and then after a while um it has to it has to mature yeah. and it has to plateau at some point and um you know you can't sustain 14 15 16 percent growth year over year no, for an extended not. period of time so um at craft beer has seen its ebbs and flows since long before i could ever drink um you know since prohibition days since pre-prohibition um since some decisions that were made uh, in the government like the 80s if i remember right um so it, it has its ups and downs and um you know at right now there's i think there's six thousand breweries across the united states and wow. well over 100 here in arizona wow, that's it. six thousand doesn't really that's, sound like that much that's, a lot. <laughs> that's an absolute lot is it okay um, <laughs> i guess when i'm thinking of the united states i'm like how many mcdonald's are there in the united states <laughs> <laughs> yeah comparing to the golden arches it's usually going to make yourself look small it's like more like how many in and outs are there across okay, the states yeah, there you and, go um you know it's 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 fun because we get to go to these tap rooms and as long as you focus on your tap rooms, I think most breweries uh, will do well. And obviously quality, quality, quality is what we're all preaching right now. And, um, there's so much beer out there still left to taste, uh, whether it's ours, we're always trying brand new stuff. Um, there's breweries, uh, that I literally pass on my way home every night that I still need to make sure I stop and go say hi and have a couple pints with those guys. And um, that's awesome. Man. As long as there's people that, want to support the local neighborhood uh, brew pubs and want to support their, their local bars, um, th we could break that ceiling easily. You know who has fucking phenomenal beers, and it's not just because I'm biased because I love it there, but Fort Collins. Yeah. Or just Colorado in general. Yeah. But Fort Collins, I I love that place, and uh, a lot of my listeners are turning off right now because I fucking talk about it all the time. But um, – I, uh, they, they've like, it's one of those things where I've always loved ever since I've been there for the first time, I always loved Fort Collins specifically in, in Colorado. It's and a beautiful city, man. I've gotten to go up there. I love it there, yeah. man. And, um, every time I'll, I'll, I'll be trying some kind of new beer and I'll look it up and there's like at least like three or four within the last year. Yep. are All from Fort Collins. I feel like that. Uh, I've been fortunate to be sent to Denver for our great American beer fest team. Oh, that's cool. And, uh, every year when I show up, I'm always like. Uh, hearing about a couple new breweries that I got to try out there or new breweries that are being distributed in Denver, mm -hmm. um, you know, Colorado, uh, between Denver, um, San Diego, Portland, those are kind of like the meccas of craft beer. Are they? Uh, Portland would probably say they are more specifically. That makes sense. Kind of easier when the hops are literally green. <laughs> right um, but Denver is always crazy fun to go and check out. Like I'm, I'm a local drinker wherever I go. Um, yeah. You know, when I go back east, I might have my yingling real quick. and mm -hmm. um, But for the most part, I'm like, all right, who's on your menu that I need to try while I'm here? I, I'm here for three days. I'm here for seven days, whatever it is. I better, you know, get a, get to try what you guys have got going on. Like, And that's fun because, like, if you come out here, uh, there's a lot of hoppy beers. We're hot forward brewers here in Arizona. Um, you know, we've interesting. We've I've never picked heard up. That. So, I mean, IPAs had a West Coast style IPA, mm -hmm. um, which is there was it was a massive surge of hoppy as hell beers, um, and it was primarily coming from San Diego and all up the you know PCH on the southern coast, and um, a lot of those brewers are just really hopping everything heavy, and that leaked in Arizona, and um, we were like, hell yeah, we want our beers hoppy as hell, but it's also because of our climate, you know, it's yeah. when it's hotter outside. 
as long as the beer is not overly malty, you can usually enjoy a, a hoppier beer a little more. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it obviously depends on the style. There's some beers that are just super danky. Yeah. And what you need afterwards is a glass of water to like, <laughs> clean the palate. But some like uh, Juicy Jack or Moon Juice are super refreshing, even though they're hoppy and it's hot as hell outside. Um, and so that that West Coast style pale ale or West Coast style in IPA has kind of helped us establish ourselves as yeah man we're gonna we're gonna take that tank and we're gonna smash a bunch of hops in it. What do you think are some of the biggest differences between uh, American pale ales and Indian pale ales? Well, it's a different style, so it's it's, it's a category of beer. Um, which uh, American pale ales, uh, when you add them. American, you're usually meet designating. You're using mostly American hops, which give off mostly citrusy notes. But hops are um, hops are a cousin to the cannabis plant, and, and as you can have different flowers in there, you can the same thing with beer. So there's so many different flavors and combinations you can come up with. Um, but like hop shock you were talking about is very grapefruity. Yeah. Um, none of that is because there's grapefruit in it. It's just because the hops that we use, um, with a touch of some uh, New Zealand hops, uh, give off that really great. A grapefruit bite that's crazy Holy so shit. the difference is really just um how hoppy the beer is uh how malty it is um which these days with oh, with blonde blonde ipas and all the different styles you can uh, brew now um it really comes down to your ho- alcohol content and uh your ibus so another um another question as far as like how everything is put together is what makes a high alcohol content like how does that process work it comes down to a a beer term that they call gravity um, which you're just basically it's how much sugar is being suspended in that water so if there's more sugar uh suspended in water when you feed the yeast it's going to keep eating keep eating keep eating and it will keep creating the alcohol so if there's more to eat there's more alcohol to create um so it's really just comes down to your sugar content in your boil Oh, okay, well, that's just simple enough. <laughs> I was like, I was like, I remember being, I remember being a little kid, and wondering like, what, how do they just put alcohol and be? Like, I don't understand. Like, it, it's just this big tub <laughs> that they just take Everclear and yeah. dump into it. I was like, what the fuck is this? Yeah, it's and all now, science, man. And I understand that. I mean, I've, I, I, I've understood for years that that's not how they do it. But, <laughs> um, yeah, that's really interesting. It, it's funny though. Like I was thinking about that the other day. Like the stupid shit that you think of as a kid that like makes sense as a kid. Uh, this doesn't make sense at all as you get older, but like I think it's life in general. It's just life in general. Yeah, <laughs> life made sense, perfect sense when I was in eighth grade, and I was like, yeah. "Oh, this is all you do is go to school all day, go play with your friends, and go to bed and do it over again." Okay, this is awesome. Yeah, and then uh, no. I'll yeah, start. I know, man. I, I I wonder, like I, I was talking to someone about that the other day about high school and about how I don't like. I feel like. M- most people I know had like at least somewhat of a rough time in high school. And I, and I feel like I was, I was saying, I, I don't know if I can trust anybody who says that the high school was the best years of their life. Never know, man. Uh, I, you know, I, I kind of had a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde with high school. Oh yeah. Like just some years I absolutely loved it. And some years I, I wasn't my favorite time. And were you a sports guy? I didn't play sports. I love sports growing up. Um, you know, I tried to skateboard when I was in junior high and rode, BMX bikes a little bit for my freshman sophomore year, um, so that was the extent of my my sports. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I played baseball growing up as a as a kid, and uh, I wrestled a little bit in eighth grade, and um, eventually separated my shoulder, um, and then just got eighth grade, ninth grade lazy, where I was just like, oh, I don't want to play any more organized sports. So the wrestling coach wanted to get me on the wrestling team because I was like one of the taller kids, and I'm kind of broad. And uh, I was like, no. It was fun. I loved it. It made me uncomfortable. (laughs) I loved it. It was it was such a great sport to play and um, or or play wrestling. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And we had such a great coach at Gilbert Junior, um, and we had some really good, uh, some great wrestlers. uh, One of which became a good friend of mine that I still hang out with to this day. And um, it it was interesting being exposed to that life, which. I kind of wish I would have stayed with sports in general through high school because you get into that life of 6 a.m. practices, uh, having to be up early, being responsible, get your homework done. Um, it did create a great environment to grow up in to try and make sure that um, that was kind of like your real life test right there because that's kind of what it becomes at a certain point is uh, making sure that you're taking care of yourself, uh, taking care of your body, 
um, you know, and then there's the respect of the rules and uh, all these little life lessons that you didn't realize were being taught to you as a kid. And uh, you look back on it and you're like, ah, you know, that kind of structure is probably good for you. I needed that, man. I should see, like, I, I, I was, like, such a little, like, angsty emo kid. Like, okay. I wouldn't touch sports or anything like that. But I, I, it, I definitely missed out on a lot of discipline and I missed out on a lot of, like, all the shit that I've been learning over the last few years as I've been trying to get various creative projects off the ground and learning to love the work was all shit that like I could have gone so much farther if I would have learned this 10 years ago. <laughs> right. And that's why sports was so great. And, uh, you know, I, I preach that any parent out there, uh, has their kid play some kind of sports, yeah. um, or, uh, it gets involved in that way. And, uh, you know, I wish I'd take a little bit better care of myself these days, but, uh, working in the beer industry, makes it <laughs> tough and, uh, but, it, I, I, it's funny that sports create. You mentioned, you know, being an angsty emo kid. Mm -hmm. I, I, I grew up on emo through all junior high yeah. and high school. Where, uh, you know, I, I remember Panic at the Disco back when I Write Sins came out, uh -huh. and before they became this big Broadway style band. Now. Yeah. Um, and like I grew up with all that music surrounding me, um, and sure I might have felt emo or something yeah. like that once in a while, but, um, I never. I never linked myself and latched myself to it where I was able to kind of be a chameleon where I was hanging out with some friends that played football and stuff like that. And, um, you know, I still hung out with the friends that uh, did nothing but ride bikes and skate. And uh, and then I also had just the friends that all they wanted to do was hang out in trucks with loud speakers <laughs> all weekend. Um, so I had this great balance. And uh, I think looking back on it now, it's kind of it's kind of the path that I've always followed is to stay balanced that way. I mean, today, you know, I work in analytics and marketing, which is two completely opposite different things until they need to collide. Mm -hmm. um, and so keeping a structured balance has really helped me stay um, from feeling like I lived my chemical romance to just enjoying it. <laughs> it's very interesting. Yeah, it's, yeah are you, it's, you seem very zen. Just very kind of like try to yeah, be, man. man. It's like it's cool. I, mean, I got this. <laughs> it's one of those things where it's just like I have my moments where I can, of course, I can get super hyped and um, you know my blood gets rushing mm -hmm. and there's times where I'm just like, like I, I do, I, you know, I'm doing another podcast right now and I've done TV spots for Santan and you know what other podcasts are you doing? Um, I did Why Arizona with the guys at Rensler. That was a great one. If you haven't listened to that one yet, they just feature local uh, uh, f people. Uh, which Why is, Arizona? Yeah, kind of like the city. I will crush them. I'm just kidding. Um, they uh, I, every single time I add because I've had guests on before who are like, yeah, man, I just kind of another podcast, and I, it's always something different, and it's always something. I Dude, don't there's know. so many of them right now. Yeah, and it's great, and I love I love getting asked. They're just like, I'm like, I don't even like what I like. I looked up. I'm like, oh great, he's he's interviewed a shitload of local bands, some mm -hmm. I've heard of and some I haven't. Yeah. Um, and I was like. I get that, you know, I'm not a musician and I, I, I don't have anything to debut with you guys. And, um, but I do know that I'm in all, a lot of the people that you've talked to. Yeah. I saw you, you got to talk to the main and not uh, me. That wasn't me. You talk talked to, to fairy bones, yet. sorry, bones, fairy yes. bones, yeah. which, um, I, I have been really wanting to dive into them because I've seen them start to pop up in my feeds now. And, um, you know, some of these yep. local bands that I haven't, uh, paid enough attention to, I still latch onto my old the ones I grew up with, with like Lydia and mm. scary kids and some of those Fucking guys. scary kids. I know, dude, man. I know. I need to find somebody from that band who was like still hanging around. Uh, I, I still keep tabs on a couple of the guys. Um, and they're kind of scattered throughout, uh, the world right now. But, um, you know, I, it, it reminds me that I can hang out and talk to just about anybody, but there's also times where I, I just want to put my headphones on. Totally. And just zone out. So it, it's, I do try and keep that balance. The girlfriend laughs at me. She's like, what do you mean you're not that social? I'm like, um, <laughs> I am when I am, and I'm I'm absolutely not when I'm Dude, not. I'm the and, same way. And I love being able to keep those two separate because I, I feel like I would fry myself if I was just always like, I've got to talk, I've got to talk, I've got to talk. And then I would also – we've all got caught in that moment where mm -hmm. we do seclude ourselves and feel a little more recluse. Um, and so keeping myself mm -hmm. going back and forth between those two is just a really nice game of – like spiritual pong. That's what I'm trying to figure out right now. I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to approach this kind of like, I think I'm going to go out of town this weekend and clear my head a little bit, but I, between like, I just got a new job recently and between that and 
like doing the podcast stuff and I'm about to start making uh, YouTube videos regularly for a YouTube com- uh, YouTube channel that I partnered with and like and they get they're like super popular and stuff so it's just like I'm just like my brain I'm starting to like not remember conversations I'm starting like my I, I just feel it slipping like yeah. I feel like I need a little tune up I need to kind of get my shit back together but it's it's weird like I'm just starting to lose grasp of things like my brain is just like reaching like critical mass <laughs> yeah and that, sometimes you just need that recharge I yeah. go and sometimes I'll just go for a drive driving yeah. is my my one of my centering abilities of just like I get in the car put on some tunes uh, which is um, I, I love music because it does help me totally. center and focus myself, uh, focus myself on what I'm trying to concentrate on. Um, so going for a drive um, allows me to just kind of lose myself in the music. Um, I remember there was one time I was having a, a really tough time with something, um, and I decided just to take off down the Beeline Highway uh, and was listening to an old album from the starting line. And, ah, ended ah, up, nice. <laughs> and ended up just like parking somewhere out by the Four Peaks Mountains and just kick my feet out the window. And you you take a moment of it to think and to try and figure out what it was jumbling. And then at a certain moment, you just tell yourself, let it all go. And you just enjoy what you're in for a second. Have you ever fucked with um, float tanks? Mm-mm. Do you know what they are about them? The sensory uh-uh. deprivation chambers? Oh, okay. I know what you're yeah, talking about. Yeah. I, float tank is like the new term i think it it would scare the living shit out of me man if it it does it's a good thing it's one of those things where it's it's like like certain like um uh i don't uh, what like psychonauts i guess what you call them like psychedelic like uh like people like terrence mckenna and like people who go really deep into psychedelics i'm not one of those people but um one of the things that they say about trip because it is kind of like a trip in a way and they say that there's no such thing as a bad trip because you always learn something right and that's kind of how it is with the tank like i've gone in the tank twice the first time was amazing and it was it was definitely a reflection of where i was in my life at that time i was still like i hadn't moved out yet i was still living at home with with my folks i was like 19 or 20 or so and um i was just chilling it was amazing it was like it was very mildly psychedelic and cool and just like being in the water that's heated to the same temperature as your body temperature and you can't hear like i could hear my eyelids like blinking it was (laughs) fucking it was unnerving man and i loved it second time i went in i was moved in or moved out on my own and i had a lot more stresses going on and i could i you're in there for an hour and i pulled out after 30 minutes because i just had a total panic attack but i got way more growth out of that session than i did the first one the first one was just like yeah i'm relaxed but the second one's okay now i know what i have to fucking work on (laughs) it's cool man i would like i would i recommend it to people all it's 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 definitely one of those things where like if I had more money, I would do it more often because it's definitely on the expensive side. But it's a it's a cool little treat for yourself, and it's never what you think it's going to be. You always kind of learn something or take something new away from it. Yeah, it's, it's cool. It's really relaxing. It would be cool to experience. And it. have it's, some in Gilbert too. It's something that you know I've always seen friends post that they're doing it, or I just stumble across it through mm-hmm. some kind of platform that yeah. I'm on, and. You know, there's I have that devil and angel moment of like, dude, that would be really cool to experience. And then, you know, there's that devil going, yeah, but you don't really like tight spaces and you're going to feel like you're boxed into something. And uh, it doesn't the reason it okay everyone's different. But the reason it doesn't feel like that to me is because you're in complete darkness and you can't tell how small the area your space is. is. Yeah, that was my thing is I would completely forget that I'm in a box that's like i don't know like eight feet long and like a giant egg yeah it's a giant egg and i forget that i'm sitting in that until like my feet touch something and then i'm like oh shit i'm like all the way and but because yeah because you're so wrapped up in the nothingness you can like i I would like push my feet slightly to put my head towards the top and it felt like i was going a great distance before i got there it's cool it just totally changes that's why like I always tell people who are claustrophobic, like, and I don't don't work for them or anything, but I tell people all the time, like, it doesn't really feel like you're being closed in because you eventually, once you just let go, you totally, it disorients you in in the the most pleasing way. You kind of forget that you're, I I, I felt like I was in space. Like, I was in this weird, tangible space. It was cool. Yeah, and uh, those kind of... um moments of uh greater thought uh-huh. and deeper thought are always uh fun because uh well hopefully fun yeah uh, but some <laughs> i know there's a lot of times where it's not and yeah. there's times where you have to really dig through some shit but um you know there are those times where sometimes you just get to drift off into old 
uh, positive memories or things that might be coming up that excite you. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that's where um, you, you kind of have to look for it a little bit. Um, you know, you don't always want to control mm-hmm. your thoughts in one direction too much because you'll, you'll lose grip on reality. At least. Yeah. Uh, I feel like that way. But um, yeah, they say to let go. They say to just like let it go wherever it takes. But there's times where you can use that kind of like a sensory deprivation chamber um, where you can just start to dig into, okay, what is exciting me? And it doesn't have to be a scary moment where mm-hmm. some people are like, no, I don't want to be trapped in a cube alone with my thoughts right now. Um, it's like go in there looking for the bright side and looking mm-hmm. at especially in the darkness, which yeah. is kind of ironic. Uh-huh. Um, to look for that stuff that's on the horizon that it, it, as long as you reach for it and you try for it, it's going to be, uh, it's going to feel really good. Mm-hmm. And, and you're able to kind of maneuver your mind towards that direction. And hopefully it leads to what you're trying to do. Yeah. It's, it's, it's cool, man. I, I, I dig stuff like that. I've, I've had a lot of friends who, um, and, and not only friends, but people who I look up to in, in the arts and whatnot, always, always talking about psychedelics and mushrooms and things like that. I'm like, terrified to do anything like that i haven't done anything like that like i i took too much of an edible one time and that was fucking mayhem so like i i don't know i don't know i i because i do feel like because i've got i've i talk a lot on the show about mental health and mental illness and stuff like that and i i have a lot of a lot of anxiety uh issues and um and i always feel like some people just aren't cut out for that. Like some people, especially people who are very anxious types like me, sometimes that can just like go way the wrong way. And yeah. weed's the same way. Like not everyone should be smoking weed. Some people just not like everything's for shit. everybody. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I don't. So the the float tank for me, I guess, to wrap up this little digression, was kind of this interesting way for me to go into that in a completely controlled state, mm-hmm. where at any point I can just like open the lid and be over it. Yeah, and it's. You don't always have to find something um, as far as a substance goes, which it, it's I think our generation kind of hasn't totally grabbed, grasped that. I mean, it, you look at all the kids that um, were pumped full of, you know, some kind of attention mm-hmm. uh, a, a disorder, yeah. uh, correctors and it, just everything that these uh, kids have taken their whole life. I've been fortunate that I haven't had to. And I get mm-hmm. that there's people that do. Um, so it, it, there's a need for it. But. Um, you know, always feeling like there has to be something there to help take the edge off um, can kind of lead people down that path. So it's great to find like a, cent- a, a chamber where mm-hmm. you can just go in and just relax and it does let you expand your mind a little bit or just go into the woods. Mm-hmm. Um, I loved hiking. That's exactly what I go hiking for is yeah. to, um, you know, be able to let my mind go do whatever it needs to do. Um, without having to have something aid it, but I, I, I totally get in respect. There's sometimes that people just have to. Yeah, uh, hopefully on Saturday. I have this weird spot in Payson that I always like to go to, yeah. like in the middle of like. I went to the ranger station and I wanted to get a map and I was looking over the map with one of the rangers and I was like, hey, can you tell me a little bit of fucking my dog is ridiculous. And I was like, can you tell me a little bit about like this area and like point it on the map and he's like oh yeah those are like that area like i don't know we haven't touched that in years and i'm like yeah motherfucker. Like, uh, <laughs> that's my area he's like i can tell you all about this circle around the <laughs> yeah. tower uh, i can see it every day uh, yeah that's about it yeah it's, it's it's just it's crazy like the ranger had to look at something else to even know where it is and so i go out there every once in a while and it's so silent that you just like you you can yell and hear the trees just carry it for miles. There's nothing out there. There's just like these weird little access roads off of, off of like a, a road that's not even anything to begin yeah. with. Great camping spots, man. Yeah, there's. There, it's mainly used for hunters. Like yeah. a lot of like there's like be some, careful out there. Yeah, sometimes. I know, right? <laughs> there's there's some like hardcore campers, but usually it's like hunters who have those giant like house tents and they oh, just yeah. stay there for yeah. weeks and weeks on end. Yeah, they got um, a, a lot of it's for scouting too. Those guys will be out there just waiting and seeing what's on their their lot that they get to hunt when it time, comes time for hunting season. So yeah. uh, it becomes a mini home for them out there. Yeah, I haven't. I've never been hunting. I'm definitely curious. I haven't either, it. but I've got tons of family and uh, yeah. lots of people from back east. I love going hunting. It's just it was one of those like the <laughs> the entry to hunting is getting up super early, and that's just not usually my <laughs> thing. So I'm just like. No, uh, it's it's waking up wake early, up early and then days and days of physical exertion and yeah. like <laughs> concentration at the same time. And I'm like, you go make yeah. sure uh, if you're getting deer this year, make sure I get some of that jerky. Right, we'll bring, call me back, it even. bring me back some elk, dude. Elk's delicious. Yeah. 
Like, I haven't had, like, truly brilliant, like, great elk. I just had it for my Fuddruckers or whatever. <laughs> fuck, it's so good. So no, is bison. Man. Bison's pretty good, too. Yeah, you got to get uh, some of the fresh, like, elk during hunting season and stuff yeah. like that. And uh, just obviously real gamey, um, you know, lots of – a little more iron and those kind of meats. Mm-hmm. But um, just so good, dude. What's your, uh, what's, what's your favorite thing that's on at Santan right now? Uh, so right now it's our whiskey. Uh, really? We, yeah. It's a whiskey now. We just released our uh, whiskey and two vodkas. Oh, um, yeah, because you guys are expanded now from just beer. Yeah, we right? uh, we decided to try out our hands in distilling, or Anthony and uh, our head distiller, Brant, did. That was um, pretty, pretty recent, right? Somewhat? The project has been going okay. on for a little <laughs> while, um, just learning things. They've been, like, testing equipment and stuff like that, and... Um, we've started to unveil some of the early barrels that we've had. They're kind of young. They're about 18 months, most of them, um, in this first batch that you can find in stores right now. Um, so it's relatively young, but it has this really great smooth taste for uh, whiskey. That's only about less than two years old. And, um, it's been my absolute favorite to drink right now. I'm, I've always, uh, been a guy that if, if you see a glass of whiskey in my hand, you know I'm about to go to bed soon. <laughs> like my my night is ending. Yeah. Um, and so now I have something that's made in our warehouse that I get to pour just neatly over the rocks and or you know uh, yeah. over a little bit of ice and um, just so damn smooth. Is that is so? That's like for sale now. Like that's like yeah. We have it at the brew pubs. Um, if you happen to be around Phoenix or Chandler, make sure and come try them. Um, and then uh, it's in, like, Gilbert Convenient Mart. Um, I think uh, one of the Tempe liquor stores down here on Apache has it. Um, and then fries all around the city, and soon it'll be in your, your bashes in it's the fr- way. It's fry. Is that fr- it's at fries already? Um, uh, quite a few of them, yeah. I think we're in, like... Are you with the one right here in, in Tempe? Uh, I can't I remember off the top are. of my head. I, I'd imagine we are. Um, yeah. We're in um, most of, like, the East Valley. We've mm-hmm. got most of those stores covered. That's um, crazy. What's it called? Uh, so this whiskey is called Sacred Stave. Okay. Um, Anthony really got drawn to that name. Um, you know, be, the staves being the each individual panel of a barrel. Okay. Um, and he uh, ran with Sacred Stave as the whiskey. He's got some really cool names coming up for some secret projects that we're working on that nice. I can't wait uh, for us to unveil mm-hmm. in the next, I don't know, y- couple years probably. <laughs> it's, it's that kind of a project. Um and so we got sacred state for that and then the vodkas we just call um vodka and uh lime vodka so the sacred stave is that under like is it like santan yeah and then they're all under it. so we we have santan distilling yeah got it. um just because it wouldn't make sense to put santan totally. brewing on a on a liquor bottle got it um but you guys have got to be up the street for me you guys, the like the, this is tempe this is like the only fries in tempe yeah like i'm sure it's there that's where all there's a lot there's actually a really good craft beer selection over there oh yeah fries town. fries in general has really picked up their craft beer selection um and they've got most of them have some or not most of them but a lot of the marketplaces have bars in them now so you can try new stuff while you're shopping and try stuff that they're selling on the shelf so maybe love this country yeah <laughs> maybe you uh shop you haven't tried bit. our lime leaf it might be on tap or juicy jacks on it some of the fries right now are you work. guys a harkins um a few of them yeah a few of them uh we have some hop shock at a couple of them um i know in chandler it, it's it's odd it's still odd to me it is weird I, um <laughs> I, I love going to movies. Like yeah. concerts are like my number one thing to do, and then movies are probably my number two. Yeah. Um. And but going like going to a concert, I'm like hell yeah, I want some great beers. Totally. But going to a movie, I'm like I just want a sprite and a bag of popcorn, which is a weird thing to say. I want everybody to go right? to, grab hop shocks at Harkins, but totally. Um. Yeah, it's still kind of strange to me to have a beer while watching a movie where like yeah. I just I, I normally like I have a beer when I'm at a ballpark or uh-huh. when I'm at a concert and stuff like that. The only problem with getting a beer at a movie is like. I usually want seconds, and I can't leave the no, movie to go. You're not get getting one it <laughs> unless that movie sucks. <laughs> yeah, right. You're like, nah, I'm not gonna miss the next <laughs> ten minutes. I don't really care. Yeah, next time I go to see like a superhero movie, I'll just come back and like, okay, they're gonna re-explain the exposition another ten times. I'll catch it. No, um, I, I, those are even the worst. I, I'm not moving. I'm not. Yeah. I don't even want to look left or right. <laughs> I'm always glued to the screen. Like, all right, you have my attention for two and a half hours. <laughs> Tell me a good story. So, okay, um, as far as like. Um, fuck. So, concerts. You mentioned concerts. Like, do you have any venues that you like that have like a good selection of beer? Um, I know Last Exit has some really good shit. Last Exit Live. You're not gonna have the rest of this. No, I'm good. You're good. You don't like it. No. You gonna tell? You gonna tell him right now? This guy right here. You're gonna tell him you don't like this beer, Alicia. I thought it'd be fruitier. You thought it'd be fruitier. He's so girly. 
No, it's uh, not quite as fruity as it might it's look like, like it would be. Ale, she likes. I don't like the peach ale. I think the peach ale is gross. Like really like it on she only likes it on tap. Yeah. Well. Whatever. It's way different. Fucking. Um. Different. There's a lot of people that like draft beer more. It's not. It's not really that weird. Yeah. Enjoy this is delicious. What are you talking about? Uh. Anyway. So, um. So local venues. Sorry. Yeah. Local um, venues. <laughs> I mean, little most. So the past few shows, I, uh, Valley Bar has great. Dude, music yes. and beer. I was uh, just there on this this weekend. They, it's it still one great. of my favorite bars to go to in town. Weird. I, I, this um, is the first time I've ever been there. Club Red has our beer, so if you're ever uh, at Club Red, you, know, you can get some San Antonio yeah. beers. If I remember right, we're we're back on there. Um, Club Red. We used to have Devils at Crescent Ballroom, um, but Crescent Ballroom always has a great craft selection uh, for their shows. You're not on at Crescent Ballroom anymore. Um, I don't think so at this point. Um, Fuck Crescent. Fuck Crescent. I'm just kidding. Oh, come on now. <laughs> no, Crescent's amazing, dude. They have some like a re- legit, like amazing shows. I've seen some crazy shit there. The smaller venues are the best for craft beer. Rebel. Uh, does Rebel have craft beer? Over there? Yeah, Rebel does great with craft beer, and we've done a couple events with Rebel before, um, or at least gone to support some shows over there. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, Rebel's great. We used to have a ton of beer in Gila River right now. We still do. Um, so if you happen to catch any of the big shows, I'm going to actually, I mentioned Panic earlier. I'm going to go see them uh, next oh, yeah. month. So I'm looking, Very to, cool. looking to have some good beers there. Most of the stadiums now uh, are starting to carry some good beers. So basically um, all entertainment venues, whether it's music, concerts, um, sports, or even some of the like entertainment areas like Dave and Buster's and stuff like that, they're all starting to pick up great craft selections because that's what people want. Yeah. Uh, you know, whether you're trying to get uh, one of the more popular locals uh, that's in most of those or whether you're trying to find something obscure in some of the smaller uh, venues, there's there's always a good selection. Especially a place like Phoenix that has such a strong, like, not only is it an extremely creative place to be, but the it's, it's weird because it's – Phoenix is always – thought of as kind of an old place like a lot of people come here to retire it is things like that but at the same time like the there's i mean we have the two universities here both of which are like extremely well known and popular and there's they 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 also have a huge numbers of, of people there like the the college kind of um drinking early drinking you know early 30s late 20s kind of mid 20s people there's a fucking ton of them and like the most of my friends of that age group are drinking craft beers. Yes, yeah. that's it's a, it's our bread and butter demographic, if you will. Is uh, you know, once you get out of your early twenties and you're just trying to make sure you can afford the next bar tab, yeah. um, you start to uh, and you have a little more disposable income and you start to try uh, better beers. And I, as craft beer becomes more affordable, which is a huge reason for that it too. Has been. Um, I mean, those 24 ounce cans, you can get two of them for six bucks, basically, which is almost uh, two monsters. <laughs> yeah, And it's, uh, you know, so as it, craft beer becomes more affordable um, and as people's drinking profiles uh, start to uh, turn for the more quality beers, um, you start to notice that 25 to 30 to 35. Uh, there's a whole lot of people that love craft beer. Another, one of the places that I I love going for craft beer, and I know that you guys are on there, is um, Spokes. Yeah. Oh, fuck, dude. That's, that's like my spot. That's like if I'm going to meet somebody or hang out with somebody or whatever, I love that spot. I used to basically live at Spokes when I was really? a rep. <laughs> um, when, I, when I sold beer in the bars and restaurants for Santan, um, you know, the um, – the whole the family that owns Spokes and both Boulders locations and uh, the new spot right here down the street from you. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the one that I got. That's the one that I know. Um, there's they've always been huge craft beer lovers and craft beer fans, so I always mm-hmm. made sure that I was in their bars, uh, you know, enjoying a pint or uh, they ha- they always carried at least a can of ours um, so that I could hang out, and have a beer, and just say hi to those guys and uh, you know trivia nights and all the fun things that yeah. they would do and some of the smaller like they would throw mini beer fests inside the bar, which is always fun. So yeah, that's like my place to go if I'm just gonna hang out with a couple of friends. Like I always go outside by the they have the little pond area mm-hmm. outside of the one. It's so the chill street. out there. Yeah, it's super cool. Like no one's really being loud or whatever, and like it's super chill. And there's like ducks walking around and shit. And it's 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 cool. It's like coffee rush but with beer. It's awesome. Love one of it. my one of my favorite. Uh, music stories came when I was at Spokes one night and we were hanging out and um, I saw this guy sitting in the corner by the where the jukebox is mm-hmm. and I'm like I'm like sitting at the bar facing the jukebox and you know, it's 2018 you can download an app now and 
yeah. send money to the jukebox and uh-huh. just play it from your bar so you don't have to get up and touch the screen and go through it like the mm-hmm. old days. And um, I remember this guy just like dumping dollar after dollar in this thing, and all he wanted to play was like Mars Volta. <laughs> What a weird pull. <laughs> and, That's such an odd choice. And at first, I'm like, I heard like a song or two, and I was just like, okay, I get it. It's, you know, it yeah. spokes. It's the neighborhood. And, uh-huh. you know, some people like Mars Volta. <laughs> and this guy wouldn't stop playing with, like, he wouldn't stop playing songs by them. And eventually, I got on my app and just started, like, pushing songs to the front of the line because you could pay like an extra quarter or credit or whatever oh, that's cool. and it would push your song to the top and so i just started loading the jukebox with like country <laughs> it was just like george Strait and tim yeah. mcgraw and, <laughs> and just some of like the favorites that i like to listen to just so i wasn't torturing myself with like jazz or something but i knew it was something that would trigger this guy totally <laughs> and, and so me and uh, whoever I was drinking a beer with at the time, I was just, like, kind of giggling, like, check out what I'm doing. And, like, country music kept coming on. And I just see this guy at the jukebox finally losing it and finally goes up to the bartender. He's like, I've put so much money in this jukebox, <laughs> and I'm just getting country out of it. And I just started dying laughing. The bartender, like, turned and looked at me like, you're doing this, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> that is fucking hilarious. Dude, okay. Quick thing before we get out of here, I, there, this is an interesting country and alcohol story. Two things that are not mutually exclusive. No. Um, I didn't understand whiskey specifically, and I didn't understand country music until I paired them together. And then I suddenly understood both very well. <laughs> Did you all of a sudden get a southern drawl to you? <laughs> yep, I get it. I, I totally Dude, understand what I, they're talking what about. What happened was I was sitting at home, and uh, uh, Alicia had our she, – she was she had, like, we had Jameson. She had some Jameson and ginger ale, and she she was out. She fell asleep. And I was like, well, fuck, man. Like, when, when I drink, like, I get way amped. Like, I get, like, really – like, just I get real talkative, and I get real happy. I'm a really lovey, kind of happy drunk usually. So I'm like, yeah, man, I'm up. I'm going to listen to some music. So at the time, I was tinkering with, like, sad bastard 70s kind of country music. My and truck is gone. My girl is gone. Yeah, that exactly. kind of country. Yeah, exactly. Love that shit. So I was starting to play with it, but I hadn't quite – it hadn't quite clicked yet. I knew that I was curious. So I put on like George Jones and yeah. I put on some of that like real tear in your beer country shit. Uh-huh. And just like the door just blew open. Like I was like, oh, this totally makes sense. Mm-hmm. Like it, like drinking alone, like drinking Jameson out of the bottle alone, listening to George Jones. I was like, this is it for me. I fucking love this shit now. This and is man. why he sings about it all the <laughs> yeah. time. And to this day, like I really, really enjoy that classic country music. And it's all because I... I sat with a bottle one night and just listened to it. Uh, beer and music go hand in hand together totally. just as much as it does with food and um, and sports and stuff like that. And uh, I thought I've always uh, loved how Dogfish Head um, puts a lot of music emphasis into um, some of their beers that they create. They have a series, or at least they used to, um, mm-hmm. that was very music uh, originated. I mean, they used to hand out um, small mini like forty five records with like Dogfish or record players with dogfish head all over it. That's they've, cool. they've always done a good job of embracing the, the, the variety of music. And I, I don't know if you're the same as me, but like you open my Apple music and my, you go through my library, you might be able to find a couple genres that you're like, okay, I get you. Totally. You've got taking <clears throat> every taking back Sunday album, whatever. Yeah. Um, but you go through it and you can find some like, you know, obscure jazz hip hop artists and mm-hmm. maybe some classical jazz and probably uh, like a Disney soundtrack. And yeah, like Down the it, same way. it, that and craft beer are just like meant for each other. And that, that's where it goes back to that conversation of there's so many different styles of craft beer Yeah. where, yeah, you might say, um, you know, uh, Def Leppard sucks, you know, but you might like something else. And there's just like beer, there's something in music that you can like and something that you yeah. will like. And in beer, there is something that you will like, even though you might not like everything. Totally. Dude, my, my Spotify, I use Spotify. My Spotify is the, exactly the same way. Like, it's it's completely, I actually am, am to the point where I can't just do shuffle all songs anymore. That's Because fun, it's though. just too ridiculous. <laughs> like, because like, one minute I'm listening to, like, Primus, and then the other minute I'm listening to Tom Segura stand up. And then, and like, it just, like, goes from the, like all over the place. So I have, like, these, ex- like, I'm really, like, I mean, obviously this, this podcast is, li- like, Moving forward, it's not just music anymore. Like I have you, I have you on, and, I have, and I'm having some other guests on uh, 
that are lined up right now who aren't music. They're just notable for various other reasons. And um, but generally, like that is the big like. Music and horror movies are my two huge hubs nice. for absolute, like, boundless passion. Like, I can talk encyclopedic about it all day long. And uh, with music, it's just completely all over the place. So, like, I have – I just have – I have, like, 50-something, like, playlists. And, they're, and they all have, like, hours and hours of music on them. And instead of shuffling all songs, I have no choice but to shuffle playlists because my songs is just fucking, it's just insanity. Like it's way too much. It's all over the place. I've done it once in a while where, uh, cause when I, you know, when I work at my desk, I always keep music on in my ears at some point. And, uh, there's been times where like, I, I'm usually good at like, okay, I'm feeling this album today. Yeah, like, same. Uh, yesterday album it was guy. like, I was like, all right, uh, college dropout and man on the moon. That's what I'm gonna listen to today. And, um, and, and today, I, I think I probably went through Paramore's uh, albums and um, you Dude, know Riot it, was the shit when I was a kid. Oh my god, that so Riot record was their, like <laughs> their new album's fantastic. I, I know love it. it's crazy. After Laughter is phenomenal. Yeah. I, I hope I get to see them when they come here soon. Um, but it, it's like I can go through all those different changes. Uh, but there's times where I I just don't know what album or I don't even know what artist I want to listen to. I don't Same. know what. Like Pandora's not going to cut it for me. Like I, I don't want to listen to that one station, and I don't mm-hmm. want to mix eight of them. Um, so I'll just say screw it, uh, shuffle it up, and you know let me go from Kenny Loggins to <laughs> the Beatles to um, to the main song in Aladdin and stuff like that. It's just, <laughs> like I don't have any comedy saved in my library for uh, that reason. Yeah, though. that's smart. I should probably get rid of it. I I haven't really caught myself listening to too many comedy albums these days. I mean Tom Segura's a great one. Yeah. I love his stand up. Um, but it's for that reason of I don't want to shuffle it into what I'm listening to because it's like yeah. one second it's like BT and some old school like uh, techno and then it's just like dick and fart jokes. And yeah, like, I know, <laughs> same way. I, I have, so my my favorite comedian of all time is, is George Carlin. Like he's a huge influence on like the way I think and all this stuff. He was a huge like discovering him as a like a 14 year old. Like, I discovered him like just before he died. That was like this insanely insane water. He was phenomenal, yeah. Like he just taught. I just like my whole life shifted when I discovered him. But like I have him saved on there too, and that's always crazy because like I'll have it on shuffle and it'll go from some kind of cool indie pop song to like feminist should suck my dick and it's like what the fuck like god damn it like, like <laughs> i was just concentrating on something <laughs> like and then i've got other people in the car with me and then it's the conversation and then we have to start digressing about context and jokes and what is and isn't funny and it's just a complete mess so like i i should probably go through it's just like it's too much of a like an insane abyss for me to even clean out my spotify at yeah. this point like i just have to like take it for what it is and kind of leave it there um dude thank you so much for fucking coming over and hanging dude, out with me fun. thanks for talking to me i, I love chilling. teaching beer and dude uh, yeah i learned a lot hopefully um we'll catch up soon we'll go uh catch a show or something dude we can, we can jump into some music stuff and whatever the podcast ends up turning into man um hopefully you're able to branch out to as many people as you you really want to talk to and just learn from as many people as you can that's yeah that's what i'm doing right now man i'm, I'm trying to like it's i love shooting the shit with bands and like that's always going to be like my that's the thing that I've, i'm good at i love yeah. doing that like that's like like for instance like joe rogan that's the firstborn child yeah exactly like, <laughs> like, like rogan has like he and he's kind of like my thing that I base everything off of. He ha- he'll have like really insane like economists come on a show and he learns a lot from them. But at the end of the day, his like other comedians that he has on, that's where all of the good shit is. That's like the really fun stuff. But I want to start going away from that a little bit and um, kind of le- like I'll have like two musical guests and then like one person who I can learn a lot of shit from. And like that was like the you were kind of like one of the beginnings of that. Like then I'm gonna have a couple other musical guests on. And then, like, I have, like, this this girl, uh, Lexi Joy, coming on the show who's, like, this really opinionated sex worker. Huh. And we're going to get, like, really deep into, like, topics all over the board when it comes to that. And, like, so. Is that one that you have to, like, put a disclaimer on? You're like, this podcast. No, no, no. no. <laughs> Dude, I, I've gotten, like, th- this this show is so raunchy. I've gotten r- way raunchy and crazy on this show before. Because that's what, that's what it's all about for me. That's why I love podcasts. Is you can just, like, hang out and be raunchy and not give a shit. And, and sometimes you never know where the conversation's going to go. And that's yeah. that's why I love some of the podcasts that um, 
aren't as directed and Same. overproduced. And it's mm -hmm. like, I literally just get to hear uh, whether it's somebody that I connect with, somebody that I know that's hosting it, mm -hmm. or literally just a couple strangers just t sharing their stories back and forth, which is uh, what our beer is about. It's what our motto is. It's literally uh, having a beer and usually a plate of food to share conversation. It, the long end of it is uh, to pair craft beer with craft food to inspire great conversations. And <laughs> that's why every time anybody's like, hey, do you want to do a podcast? I'm like, if, if it's more Santan specific, like an official, uh, like I'm here on behalf of Santan, um, it's still just as fun as, dude, let's just kick it and yeah. hit record and talk for a few minutes. That's, that's what I built the whole thing on was just like, I fucking hate interviews. I like conversations. I like people hanging out. And like, I want to actually get to know the artist, not just what they're selling or not just the product that they're working on right now. I, I want to actually get to know them and, and listen in on this conversation that these two people are having. The best compliment that I ever got on this show um, one of my guests sent me a screenshot of the conversation. They were talking to somebody, and they were like, "Yeah, man, I, the the person who was texting—I don't remember what—I don't remember which guest it is. That's what I mean. My mem my memory lately is just like my brain's oatmeal. <laughs> but um, they sent me the screenshot, and the person was like, "I got really uncomfortable halfway through listening to your conversation, honestly, because it felt like I shouldn't have been there. Like it felt like I was just like listening in on two people having a conversation, and I was like." Fuck yes! Like that's exactly what I mean. I don't want you to be uncomfortable. Like yes, but that's lose exactly yourself what I and wanted. just enjoy it. And like just that's yes. Be perfect. the fly on the wall. That's what a yes. podcast is. It's you exactly. literally get to be a fly on the wall in somebody's conversation. Yeah, dude. Thank you so it's much. Been fun. Again. Good yeah. luck to you, man. Ha Absolutely. Have fun with it. I will. And uh, thank you everybody for listening. Really quick, so that I don't have to do this in post. Uh, quick shout outs to all of my Patreon supporters, as promised. Um, go to gangstoked.patreon.com and uh, support me. Support the show. Support podcast. Support. Bad words. Uh, Austin Carson, Every Show Joe, Bradley Palermo, Aubrey Hoffer, um, Courtney Gagos, Miguel Lopez, Tom Maxwell, Bryce Koppel for, don for donating the lights that we use for the YouTube videos, and my mom and my grandma for <laughs> helping out the show. Thank you guys so much for listening. Thank you for coming over, man. I really appreciate it. And thank you for the little beer gifts and um, for the awesome care package that you threw together for the live podcast um, that, we, that we did with Chelsea and Fairbones. That was a fucking great time, man. So, uh, yeah, that's it, guys. Thank you so much. Get stoked. Okay. Patreon supporters. Austin Carson, Every Show Joe, Bradley Palermo, Aubrey Hoffer, my mom, my grandma, Courtney Gallegos, Miguel Lopez, Mr. Tom Maxwell, and Bryce Koppel for donating the lights. Thank you very much. If you want to become a supporter, go to gettingstoked.patreon.com, I think. Or maybe it's patreon.com slash gettingstoked. One of the two. Look up Getting Stoked. And then... Um, patreon just throw that bad boy in the google search and you will find me um and give me your money and i will give you stuff in return and you can feel good about yourself and i'll feel great about you and wow, that has got to be the fucking worst pitch for anything in the world oh my god stay tuned for this messages oh shit look at that the episode's over, man. We're done. Episode is finished. Luckily, though, there are plenty of other older episodes hanging around the internet anywhere you'd like to find podcasts. iTunes, podcast apps like Stitcher or Podcast Addict uh, for the, either the iPhone or the Android. Uh, my official Podbean website. I'm fucking everywhere, man. I'm building an empire. Let's take over the fucking world. Um, anyway, if you've made it this far, I truly appreciate you and encourage you to please reach out and say hello. I'm serious about this, guys. I really want to connect with my listeners. So whether you want to come on the show or not, drop me a line. Uh, hit me an email at gettingstokedpodcast at gmail.com. Or you can hit me up on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, I think that's it, man. Thank you guys so much for listening. It really... I know I, I harp on it so much, but it really, truly means everything. So thank you. Get stoked. <laughs>